Hello, brothers and sisters. Paul Borthwick coming to you from Lexington, Massachusetts, on the east coast of the United States. I would say to you greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, as well as Mabuhai, one of the few words that I've learned in many visits to the Philippines. I regret to say that I've been to Manila and Quezon City many times, but I've never been to your place, Davao. I have been to uh, Mindanao, but only to the city of uh, Cagayon de Oro. The theme for this month is Love the World. And it sounds like an awesome theme. And I'll be with you for these four prayer meetings as well as Sunday the 26th. And I'm excited to be able to talk about practical ways that we can love the world. But if you told me, love the world, the very first thing I would say is it's too big. It's too overwhelming. There are more than 7 billion souls. Then you add to that all sorts of crises and poverty and COVID, and it just becomes overwhelming. So to start our month, I want to take us to a passage in the Gospel of John where there's an encounter of an insurmountable need, an under-resourced group, and people facing the decision of how to respond. It's in John's Gospel, chapter 6, and I'll be reading from John's Gospel in the New International Version. It says, starting in verse 5, these people, to give you the context, the people are actually walking with Jesus, listening to him, and they've been with him, according to other passages, a couple of days. And in Hebrew tradition, you would take someone who's been traveling with you like that and you would feed them. So when Jesus, it says in verse 5 of chapter 6, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? It says Jesus asked this only to test Philip, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for everyone to have a bite. You see, there's this vast need, and Jesus says, buy food for these people. And Philip says, we don't have the resources. It's a too big of a task. It's inadequate. And that's the way many of us respond when we think about the world in which we live. It's just too big. I can scarcely make a difference in my own neighborhood or even in my own household. How am I going to do something like change the world or love the world? Another of his disciples, though, came forward, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, and he spoke and he said, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go amongst so many? We don't know where this boy came from, but you can imagine he maybe heard Jesus say, um, you know, I want to feed these people, and he came forward and maybe tugged on Andrew's robe and said, give this to Jesus. The little boy maybe had seen Jesus do miracles in another place. We don't know. But Andrew gets a little bit of glimmer of faith from the little boy. And then he says to Jesus, here's this boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. Actually, in the Greek language, it would be adequate to say, here is a small man with five small barley loaves and two small fish. I mean, the operative word is small. And it's almost as if Andrew, when he details the resources, he disqualifies it and he gives that phrase, how far will this go amongst so many? It's interesting. Philip says we don't have the resources. The crowd is too big. The need is too vast. Andrew says, well, we have some resources, but the resources are too small given the vast need. And when it comes to loving the world, all of us can do this. It might be just that we say to ourselves, I don't have enough to make any difference, like Andrew. Or we say, I can't possibly respond to such a vast need, like Philip. But Jesus doesn't respond either to Philip or to Andrew. He doesn't correct them. He doesn't respond to them. He just says in verse 10, have the people sit down. The Bible says there was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Now, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, it lets us know that there were 5,000 men plus women and children. 
So if each man came with maybe his wife and two children, now you've got a crowd of 20,000 people. You can understand why they were feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Jesus then took the loaves from the little boy, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. Another translation says, until they were satisfied. I've been to the Philippines a number of times, and I know whenever your plate is full, people who are hosting you, they want to fill your plate for you. They want to basically say, we want you to be full. And this is what it says. It doesn't say each one had a tiny little bite. It says each one was full. And then he says he did the same with the fish. Verse 12, when they all had had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 barley loaves with the pieces of the five five barley loaves and left over by those who had eaten. Maybe there's another indication here of how the disciples were feeling because maybe they thought, you know, Jesus, we're kind of hungry and five loaves and two fish, that would be nice. But they had to distribute the fish and the loaves and then they got to gather the leftovers. And the Bible distinctively says there were 12 leftover baskets. There were 12 disciples. And it's almost like Jesus is saying, you respond to the vastness of need, I'll take care of you in the process. Jesus says, give them something to eat. And the theme for the month says, love the world. You know, it's not a matter of the size of your resources, and it's not a matter of the size of the need. The issue is, can we get our eyes off of the need, which was Philip's problem, and our eyes concentrated on the smallness of our resources, which was Andrew's problem, and like the little boy, just give what we have to Jesus. So to get us started into this month, I want us to think about three things that all of us can give to Jesus, with the last one being something you can respond to tonight as you pray. But the first thing Jesus wants from us is our availability He basically is inviting us to say, Lord, here I am, send me, like Isaiah in chapter chapter 6. Or like young Samuel, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. The people that God uses basically say, Lord, I only have five loaves and two fish. Lord, I don't have that much for resources. Lord, but I'm keeping my eyes on you. You might say, what difference will some of the things that I do make? Only God knows. Would you give what you have to Jesus? It's almost like asking the question, will I give Jesus my lunch? It's interesting. When you make yourself available to God, it's a risk. Because the little boy didn't know if he was going to be fed. All he knew is that if he gave it to Jesus, it was the right thing to do. And when you say to Jesus, here I am, Lord, send me, you don't know where he might take you. But that's the risk we make because we know Jesus loves us and he wants to use our lives to make yourself available to God. One of my colleagues many years ago was a retired lady. She had just retired from a career as a nutritionist. And she came to me and she said, Paul, I'm going to retire in a couple of months and I I don't want to sit in a rocking chair until I have to. She was 67 years old. And she said, can you use me? Can God use me? So I said, I'll look into it. Her name was Marion. And Marion and I made contact with a ministry in Haiti, poorest country in the world and oftentimes affected even recently by huge earthquakes, not to mention COVID. But Marion said, I'm available. The ministry in Haiti needed someone to help them prepare food for a school for children that was feeding 600 kids every week a a nutritional meal every day. She was the perfect person. She made herself available and at age 67 went to Haiti. She had some skills, she trained some Haitian cooks and by the time she was done with her first visit after four weeks, she came back home and they were feeding 2,000 kids a week 
because she had made herself available to God. And she kept on doing it. At 67, she went down. And then she went down more than 40 times to Haiti over the next 27, 25 years of her life before she passed away. She came home and had cancer surgery and she went back down. She came home and had another cancer surgery. She went back down. She had her hip replaced. She went back down. She made herself available to God. And it's only when we make ourselves available to God do we understand how much he can do with our loaves and fishes. It's an interesting thing. When I've traveled in many parts of the world, I came from a fairly traditional background. And in my church background, many of us didn't raise our hands during worship or or do anything that was animated with our you know hands and lifting up and everything like that. But many times around the world, I've seen people in their worship. And when they're praising, their hands are waving in the air. But when they're worshiping in prayer, they oftentimes have their hands open. And they're basically saying, here I am, Lord. I'm bringing you my lunch. I'm bringing you my life. Use me. Here I am, Lord. Send me. The first thing we can all offer is our availability. The second thing is our whole lives. And I distinguish the two for this reason. We offer to God our experiences, our education, our background. Dr. Keith, he has something to offer because he knows medicine. Other people know engineering. Other people just basically might know homemaking. I know of a group that I met in the Philippines who are maids for Christ. That's what they call themselves. And they offer their domestic skills and go into the Middle East where they can share the gospel by serving as maids or as laborers in the case of some of the men. And they go to these places that doesn't allow missionaries and they give of themselves with their skills. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, Lord. Use the fact that I know two or three languages. Maybe it's your heritage will enable you to reach out to people from maybe China or other parts of Southeast Asia. Maybe your experiences in business or your experiences in in the academic world will enable you to go and teach or be involved in business communities in countries where there are no other possibilities to get there, you can't be a regular missionary. Or maybe you just say, Lord, how do you want to use my gift of cooking to reach out to my neighbors? How do you want to use my gift of compassion to reach out to people in need? God wants to use the skills that you have. A funny story happened a number of years ago. I I wrote a book and at the bottom of the book it says, one of Paul Borthwick's goals is to go on a riverboat trip on the Amazon. That's the biggest river in South America and is deep into the jungle. It sounded very exotic to me. Well, one day I got an email from a guy who works with Youth for the Mission and he goes up and down the Amazon River doing medical clinics. So he says, I can help you fulfill your dream. I can take you on a riverboat trip up and down the Amazon. And I said, that's awesome. I'm ready. Here I am. I want to go. And he wrote sports back. He says, what skills do you have? He says, do you speak Portuguese, which is the language of Brazil? I said, no. Do you have any medical skills? I said, no. Do you have any mechanical skills? I said, no. He says, oh. He basically was saying, I can't find a place. I said, I can preach. I can speak. He says, but you don't speak Portuguese. It won't help us very much. Because even though we speak Portuguese on the boat, it gets translated to the village people that we go to up and down the river. So I said, sorry. He goes, what about your wife? I said, oh, my wife, she is a 40-year veteran of microbiology and especially parasitology, the study of parasites. He says, can you send her? In other words, what he was saying was, we don't need your willingness. We need her willingness and her skills. God has used her skills to take us to places using her microbiology for the sake of the kingdom. What are your experiences? Think of it in the Bible. 
when, G, when, da, when God called David, young David, he was a shepherd boy. And what did, him, what did God call him to do? To be the shepherd king of Israel. God was using his patience and his skill set of organizing groups like sheep to make him able to be the king. Or when Andrew and Peter and James and John, when Jesus called them, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What was their skill set? They were fishermen. And he's basically saying to them, what you learn by patience, what you learn by discerning the times and the tides, those things, plus your skill of developing a business, I'm going to use those skills for the sake of patience in building up the body of Christ, for the sake of organization. As you organize your fish business, I will have you organize the church. And Peter, as you know, becomes the leader in the church in the book of Acts. God wants to use your skill set. A number of years ago, a young woman came up to me and she says, Paul, how does God want to use me? And I said, well, I said, what, what have you studied? She said, oh, I just graduated uh, from university with a degree in, in hydrogeology. And of course, I couldn't really admit that I didn't know what she was talking about. But finally, I said, what is hydrogeology? She said, I know how to find wells. And she ended up going to West Africa, helping villages who were severely limited by drought to be able to find sources of water. God wants to use your availability. God wants to use your skills, your, your capacities in relationships, your knowledge of languages, your education formally and non-formally, even your background. God wants to use your background in the sense that he wants to redeem it. Talking about my wife again, she has a tremendous ministry to people who have alcoholic parents. And the only reason she can do that ministry is because she had an alcoholic mother. God has even taken the negative experiences of her childhood and used them redemptively to help others. Along the lines of Corinthians, where it says in 2 Corinthians, God comforts us in our afflictions so that we might be able to comfort others with the same comfort we've received from God. So I said there were three things. And the third one leads us into prayer tonight. As you are joining for this prayer meeting, let me remind you, availability, my hands are open. My experiences, Lord, my resume, my CV is yours. How do you want to use it? But the starting point for most of us is prayer. Because when you're overwhelmed with the needs of the world, you can take those concerns to someone who can control the issues, the God Almighty, Lord of the universe. Let me encourage you as you pray, don't be overwhelmed by the needs in the Middle East or the issues of COVID or the size of China or the issues related to wars and rumors of wars in our world. Those things are real and we bring them before God. That's why in Philippians it says, don't be anxious, but bring all of your concerns before God. You can start by praying. You know, it's sobering to remember there's no place on the wor in the world that you can't go by your prayers. Start praying for one country or one other place in the Philippines. Maybe you think about the, the Muslim population in Mindanao and that's your starting point of prayer. And don't pray against the people. Pray for Jesus to draw them to himself. And maybe you want to go beyond the Philippines and you pray for countries in Southeast Asia. Maybe Bhutan. I've always been praying for Bhutan because it's so isolated from the rest of the world. Maybe North Korea. God might use you to start praying for North Korea. And all I'm saying is God wants you to go into the, into the state houses of the world with your prayers you can pray for the President of the United States or your own president and leaders in the Philippines by name. Bring them before Jesus. The Bible says pray for kings and rulers and those who are in authority. And as you start the journey of loving 
the world, maybe the place to start is loving the world enough to know something about it so that you can pray. Maybe outside of this meeting, you want to check to yourself on the, the website called operationworld.org. One word, operationworld.org. And that gives you instructions on how to pray for every country on earth. And maybe over the course of your year, you can go around and around and around and around praying for different countries. In my country, almost all of our clothing is made someplace else in the world. And by our trade laws, you have to have on the label the thing that says where it's made. And I tell people in my country, look at the label of your clothes and pray for that country. I was speaking at a church down in the Caribbean, and I had spoken there many years ago. I told that story about labels and, uh, and the labels of your clothes. And as I was coming in, it was a very small service, less than 50 people. And as I walked in the room, the, the, the worship leader saw me and he says, Egypt, I prayed for Egypt this morning. And he, he remembered that illustration. And that morning, the shirt that he was wearing for church was made in Egypt. Maybe there's other things that you can do, ranging from technology to where your food comes from, just to remember all the places on earth that God loves. Love the world. Make yourself available to God. Say, Lord, how do you want me to love the world? And love the world and say, Jesus, here are all my experiences, education, background, even my hurts and my pains. How do you want me to use them to love the world? But especially start with prayer. Lord, help me to love the world by praying around the map for the people and the countries of the world that you love. I look forward to visiting you all through this month of September, and I thank you for being here to pray and love the world in Jesus' name. God bless you, my brothers and sisters.